All right, everybody, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started today uh, just to make sure uh, we respect everybody's time. Uh, thanks for sharing in the chat. I saw uh, a few people share uh, different shows that they're uh, binging right now, or uh, I saw someone say that they, uh, uh, that they wish they were reading more. Uh, that's kind of more my position. Uh, always wish I could be reading more. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. So today is our uh, new user webinar part two, a deep dive on data. Uh, and I'm Brian Story, and I'm one of our teacher engagement managers uh, at Assistments, and I'll be the facilitator for today's session. Just to give uh, an overview of our goal and key topics for today, uh, participants will be able uh, to learn how to maximize Assistments data in their daily classroom routine. Key topics that we'll cover include interpreting Assistments data reports, drawing conclusions from data reports, using assessments content for differentiated support, and incorporating assessments into daily routines. A little bit about webinar etiquette uh, here, just make sure that you uh, leave your microphone on mute. Uh, you can, however, feel free to share your video, uh, and the chat button is in the middle, so feel free to share your questions uh, via the Zoom chat uh, as they come up, and we'll be happy to address those. Again, I'm Brian Story. I'm your facilitator today, and I'm a teacher engagement manager with Assistments. Uh, prior to this work, I was a teacher in DC Public Schools and uh, Norfolk Public Schools in Virginia. Uh, and uh, so I'm happy to, to bring my uh, passion and expertise for education uh, to serve you today. And with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Dawn. Yeah, hi everybody. My name is Dawn Peterson. I'll be your, uh, your chat moderator today. I, I taught for 14 years in an eighth grade classroom here in Massachusetts, and I used assistance for 10 years. So just like Brian, we're happy to, uh, to spread the gospel of assistance with all you teachers out there. Excellent. Thank you, Dawn. So just a brief overview of assistance. I know uh, we have a mixture of uh, beginning uh, uh, sort of uh, brand new users, uh, people who are just getting started and also experienced users here with us today. So Assistments is a forever free tool that allows you to enhance uh, you know, the curriculum that you're already using in your class in a way that gives you lots of useful, actionable data that you can use uh, to uh, design your next instructional steps with students. In terms of interpreting assessments data uh, reports, we're gonna spend a little bit of time now just overviewing the important aspects of our data reports, uh, just to sort of norm us around uh, what the data looks like and what are the key pieces. Uh, to situate this portion of the, uh, the webinar, uh, typically we talk about the four steps of assessments, uh, and this section about data is gonna be focused on that, uh, that third step, uh, assessing class performance. So we have two key reports and assessments. First is the assignment report, and this is sort of your uh, bird's eye view. It's gonna show you the percent correct on the assignment by class, by student, and by problem. Uh, it's also gonna show you those class-wide trends, uh, for instance, common wrong answers, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then there's also the student details report. Uh, and in the student details report, uh, this zooms into one student and shows you the play-by-play -play for that student. Every attempt on a question, how much time they spent, uh, et cetera, uh, so that you can get that data when you need it. To access your report data, uh, once you've pushed an assignment into Google Classroom or Canvas, uh, you'll go back to your LMS, so Google Classroom or Canvas, to access that report. Uh, and you simply click on the assignment link uh, in the assignment body. And with that, I'm actually just gonna go live and show you what this looks like, and then we're gonna go ahead and take a look at a report. So let me go to a teacher account here. So if I'm in uh, one of my demo classes here, and I go to the classwork tab, which is where most teachers uh, like to live in the report, uh, or like to live in Google Classroom. Um, from here, you can actually click any assessments assignment, and you'll see the link in the dropdown. In Canvas, it's very similar, where uh, you can go to your assignments tab, or just right here on the home tab, uh, any assessments assignment, you can click that. And there's the link that'll take you to your uh, assignment report where you can see student data. Uh, for the purpose of this demo, I'm actually uh, just going to take a look at a report in Google, although the reports themselves look exactly the same. Okay, so this is one of our uh, assessments assignment reports. Uh, 
And uh, I kind of want to go over the key details of this so that when you're working with your students uh, and you're getting their data, that you have a very clear idea of, you know, what are the key pieces that you can focus in on. The first thing I want to point you to, uh, because we recommend that you share this data with students, uh, when you can click hide student names, and that's actually going to randomize the student rows and also, uh, you know, anonymize their names so you can't see the names. So it becomes very difficult for students to figure out who is who uh, when you want to review this data uh, with the entire class. Uh, in addition, each column represents a question. And if you're going over the report and let's say you want to demo one of these questions, you can always click that column header and that's going to take you straight into the student view for that question and it will allow you to interact with the question the same way that students would. The next row that we have here is the problem average. So you have the average score across all students and then the average score for each individual problem. I'm just going to refresh the page here. Uh, so these average scores will point you toward the individual questions that students might have struggled with the most. The next row, and this is something that, uh, that teachers who use assistance really, really like, is uh, common wrong answers. And so in this row, uh, you'll see for if there's three or more students that put the same incorrect answer on their first try, uh, we will tell you. And so what this means here is that 36% of students who put an incorrect answer on their first try uh, put the answer nine. Uh, and so that's useful information that you can use for reteaching or to, to govern class discussions with students, et cetera. The next row that you'll see here is uh, the correct answer row, so sort of your answer key. Uh, and then after that, we get into uh, the rows of student data. So each row is a student. You can see that uh, it shows the total time that the student spent on the assignment. Uh, it gives you their average score uh, on the assignment, and it shows you for each question uh, what score they got. Uh, and you'll notice these symbols, uh, I'm sure you do. We will be addressing what those mean uh, shortly. But let's say that uh, you know, you're looking at a student. Uh, I'm gonna look here at one of my colleagues, uh, Priyanka's uh, grade. Uh, this is, all of these people are people that work with assessments, so don't worry, I'm not uh, sharing people's data here that, uh, that shouldn't be shared. Um, and so I see that she got a score of 30%, and I see the data here, but maybe I wanna dig a little bit deeper uh, and see what might be going on uh, with her performance on this assignment to see how I can best help her. And so I'm gonna uh, click the triple dot next to her name. Uh, and click the details report. And this is gonna give a play-by-play -play, uh, for every single action that she took on every question. So we can see on this first question, uh, there were three incorrect attempts before the student had to ask for the answer. Uh, but, and then uh, obviously they were able to answer correctly. Uh, so as you look at this, uh, this is a great report that you can use uh, to govern your conversations with students, uh, with parents and conferences. Uh, and then a few, uh, another important feature of this page is you can actually shuffle through students by clicking previous and next uh, or by clicking the drop down and selecting a specific student uh, from those listed. The other thing you can do from this screen is uh, if there was an open response, you can do essay scoring, uh, but there's an easier way to do that. Uh, basically in any report, if there was an open response like here, you can click essay scoring. And this is going to take you to the essay scoring screen where you can see each individual student's response. You can give it a score of one through four, and then you can also give uh, feedback to each student as well. A couple of quick notes on here. You can also hide student names in this report. Uh, and you can also hide the score column uh, or comment columns and sort columns if you'd like to reduce some of the noise on this page or say take a screenshot or share it with your students. Um, the, the other cool thing you can do about this page is you can actually custom sort uh, some of these responses. Let's say you want to take a screenshot with a few specific responses and you'd like to just pull those to the top of the report. Uh, you'll do that in descending order. Okay, and so I'm just going to click the sort arrow here and that's going to bring those to the top and then I have all three exemplar responses that I'd like to talk about with students right there at the top of the report. It's also important to note here that uh, in our regular assignment report, you can choose to sort any of these columns by clicking the arrows. So if you're trying to quickly figure out how to differentiate your students and, and do like a yellow, red, green uh, and break students down based on their performance, uh, you can click these arrows and it's gonna sort students. Uh, you can do it in ascending or descending order uh, for average score or any of the scores on individual problems as well. Okay, so just to recap, 
Uh, the assignment report shows you the class score. It's gonna show you the scores by individual problem. It's gonna give you those common wrong answers uh, and show you the correct answer key as well for the questions that you assign. And then in the student rows, you're gonna see uh, the student's individual score on the assignment, uh, the amount of time they spent, uh, you'll see the triple dot next to their name uh, where you can uh, go ahead and choose to uh, look at their student details or delete progress. Uh, and then uh, you'll see this essay scoring column, of course, which you can, where you can see their open responses and click essay scoring to grade those. Again, on that student details report, you get that play by play where it shows each attempt that the students made. Uh, it shows you the amount of time they spent on each attempt, uh, and then it gives you, again, that chance to do essay scoring from here if you like. And again, note that you can either pick selected student or pick a select student or shuffle through students in your class uh, by using the navigation at the top. So you will have noticed that there were symbols uh, uh, in the report, and so I just wanted to review uh, just briefly what these mean. Uh, so assign, uh, in terms of the green check, that means that the student was correct on the first attempt and they got a score of 100%. Uh, the green X means that the student was correct on the second or third try. And if they were correct on the second try, they get a 67% score. Correct on the third try is a 33% score. The red X means that the student was correct, but they got it correct after three attempts. And so that represents a zero score. And then finally, uh, if a student presses show answer, that means the answer was provided, so their score automatically goes down to zero. And in your assignment report and the student report, you'll see a red highlighted X. It's super obvious when a student does this, because obviously if a student's clicking show answer, something has gone wrong and you want to be able to address that. And with that, I'll go ahead and pause to see if there are any questions. Uh, and uh, Dawn, if, uh, just let us know if any questions are popping up. No, uh, there, there's one that came up and I'm answering it in the chat, getting a little bit more information. So I think we're, uh, we're good to move on. Excellent. And before we move on, I did just want to show one more thing because uh, I realized I didn't demo this. But uh, when you're in the report and you click that triple dot, you can click delete progress. This is where that delete progress button is. Let's say a student really struggled with an assignment and uh, they realize they made a mistake and they come to you and say, oh, I realized what I did wrong. Can I just have another chance to show you what I know? Uh, you can delete their progress there and that will allow the student to click the link again in Google Classroom or Canvas and it'll start them from the beginning of the assignment. All righty. So now that we've sort of overviewed uh, how our data works and what the key data points are uh, from our assignment reports, now we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, how you can draw conclusions from data reports. And to do this, uh, we're going to go through a few scenarios. In these scenarios, uh, we're gonna have three of them. In the first scenario, I'm just gonna kind of walk through that directly. In the second scenario, I'm gonna ask you to share your thoughts via a Zoom poll. And in the third scenario, I'm gonna ask uh, folks to share their thoughts in more detail in the chat, and we'll have Dawn share some of, the, some of, your, uh, some of your thoughts from there. So our, in our first scenario, uh, we're taking a look at when an individual student stands out in your data report. So after teaching unit one, lesson one on scale drawings from seventh grade illustrative math, Mr. Thomas assigned the cool down to his students. That evening, he reviewed the resulting assignment report to help plan for his lesson the next day. I wanna give uh, folks a few seconds just to take a look at this snapshot of, uh, of the data from the scenario. Okie dokie, so what do we notice about this, da uh, this data? Uh, one student has several highlighted boxes, which indicates that they used all the hints and, uh, and got to show answer. Uh, in this case, they just clicked uh, uh, through all of that and uh, yeah. only spent 31 seconds total on the assignment. In terms of conclusions that we can draw, this student either needs more support uh, to master scale drawings, or they gamed the assignment by pressing show answer 
Uh, in either of these cases, we recommend that all teachers message to students. When, when you as the teacher see that they've clicked show answer, that tells you one of two things. Number one, it means that the student didn't know what they were, uh, you know, they struggled with the assignment and they need reteaching and some additional practice, or the student tried to game the assignment and uh, they haven't demonstrated their knowledge and they need additional practice, right? All roads lead back to you having to demonstrate knowledge. In terms of planning next steps, uh, we might decide uh, based on looking at that data to go ahead and look at the student details report to see the play by play for what the student did. Uh, these reports, uh, these detail reports are also great uh, for, you know, if you want to bring that student in and have a one on one conference about their performance. Given that the students spent very little time on each question and requested lots of help, they clearly did not make their best effort on the assignment. And so you may decide to meet with the student to reteach, then delete progress and have them try again. So our second scenario, uh, this is where a majority of class needs support, right? And we're gonna have folks share uh, uh, via a Zoom poll here in just a minute, so that's fine. Um, Miss Lee, a seventh grade math teacher, had students complete five problem solving problems aligned to 7EEA2, understanding equivalent expressions in context, uh, to build their understanding of this common core standard during class time. I'm gonna give uh, everybody a chance just to look at these data. Uh, note that I've labeled the columns and rows so you can see what we're looking at here. Uh, just take a moment to look at, uh, at, look at this uh, snapshot of the data. And while you're doing that, I, uh, I keep hearing some noises. So if, uh, if you're not muted, please make sure that, uh, that you mute your, uh, your audio at this time. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, have everybody take a poll. Uh, I really like these polls because it just gives us a chance to get a sort of quick pulse on where people are with understanding report data. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll now. Uh, and I'm going to give folks about uh, 30 to 60 seconds to respond to these two questions based on the, uh, the data that you see uh, in this image. All right, I see folks coming in. We have nine out of 36, 11 out of 36. That's great. Uh, take about uh, 20 to 30 more seconds. Okie dokie. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at, at, at what, uh, what we have for results. So here are our results. Looks like uh, for question one, which of the following noticings are accurate? 85% of you chose the correct answer, which is that most students scored poorly on two questions, specifically on problems four and five. And then uh, for number two, what can you conclude from the common wrong answer for problem number four? And I love this question because it's a great way to just make sure everybody's super clear on what common wrong answers mean. Uh, the correct answer here was chosen by uh, 30%. Um, and that is 67% of students who entered a wrong answer put one third, right? I noticed that lots of people put 67% of students entered the wrong answer one third. Uh, but what this actually is referring to, this 67% is referring to the total number of students who answered incorrectly, not the number of students in your class overall. Okie dokie, so moving on. In terms of planning next steps, 
Uh, you might decide uh, once you look at that data to pause your classwork and uh, review low scoring problems with students as a class, paying particular attention to those common wrong answers, maybe highlighting those or discussing with students uh, what mistake might have led to those common wrong answers. And you might, assign, uh, after you've done that with students, you might decide to assign additional problem solving questions on that standard as homework to give students more practice. All right, so in scenario three, we want you to tell us. So we're gonna go through this scenario uh, similar to how we just did, except we're actually gonna ask folks to share in the chat. So as we go through this example, think about uh, what you notice and what you might conclude and what steps you might uh, implement as a result of uh, the scenario. So after teaching her Eureka Math lesson, uh, third grade math teacher, Miss Ray, assigned practice problems from Eureka Math module five, lesson two on fractions as numbers on the number line as independent practice. Her mastery threshold for this assignment is a score of 70%. Uh, we know that different teachers out there may have different uh, thresholds of mastery. In this case, this teacher is going with a 70% score as her threshold. So I'm gonna leave the, uh, this little cross section of data here and I just want folks in the chat to go ahead and share what do you notice from this data and what conclusions can you draw from this data? And uh, we'll have Dawn share some of the responses that people share in the chat. I'm waiting, everyone's looking at it. <laughs> Thinking before they type. Yeah, we'll give folks a, right. a, a few seconds just to think about it and, uh, and figure out uh, what, what their thoughts are. Yeah. Yep, some, uh, some first glances. Uh, students have not, uh, three students have not reached mastery. Uh, not reached mastery. Um, four out of seven have reached mastery. Um, one, one person said they think two showed mastery instead of three. Um, the rest needs reteaching other than the two that, that mastered the topic. I think I uh, have different mastery goals. Some I think are looking at 65 and some are looking at 70. Every teacher has their own. Right. Teachers thinking ahead to the next step, so I'll hold off with those. But I think the general consensus is they're noticing those three, um, three students who, who struggled a little bit. Mm-hmm. All right, so, so that's correct. Three out of seven students uh, receive scores below 70% on the problem set. Uh, obviously, if you as a teacher, let's say your mastery threshold is 65% or 80%, you know, what that looks like is going to depend on you and your students and, and what works best for y'all. And then in terms of conclusions, uh, actually, uh, yeah, we'll talk about conclusions. So this, this subgroup of three students need more support uh, to master the standard, which is fractions as numbers on the number line. And uh, with that, we'll go ahead and ask uh, folks that are attending, uh, what next steps could the teacher take to respond to the data? Uh, so what are some next steps that people are sharing, Don? Uh, yep, one, one person is saying small group of reteaching for the bottom three who, who, uh, who didn't reach mastery. Um, that'll look a little bit different whether you're in the classroom or whether you're on a, a Zoom, but regardless, we've had students. Um, let's see here, need some reteaching. Or reteaching, um, intervention, or small group. Uh, looking at the questions that they missed in order to uh, do some remediation. Um, one teacher uh, recommends ass assigning some additional homework problems to the students who struggle. Going over the data, small group reteach. Looks like a bunch of these teachers, same school, they've all got the, some, some great uh, same uh, responses to the data. Mm -hmm. Breakout rooms um, if we're in a Zoom call. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, additionally, no one's really talking about the, the students who did meet their meet the, the goals. So uh, one teacher said that the four will do some enrichment uh, since it meet the mastery goal, and then the other three will get the uh, the reengagement. Excellent. All great, all great ideas. Uh, and so hopefully uh, through our session today, through, you know, again, talking about those key data points in our assignment report and kind of walking through these common scenarios that you might come across in your own uh, practice on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, this will help you to understand how you can quickly take our data and then make decisions in the moment that best suit the needs of your students. 
So indeed, uh, in terms of next steps, uh, and, and there were several different ones that were shared. Uh, one example of a next step here would be, uh, let's say that you're doing math center activities. Uh, uh, you could pull the small group of three students together and reteach and then delete their progress and allow those students to retry and demonstrate mastery. I'll go ahead and pause here for questions. Uh, so uh, give folks a few minutes to ask questions and Dawn will share those aloud so we can uh, respond to them. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, before everyone was typing in. Um, nothing to, pertaining to what we just talked about. I answered a few questions in the chat, but, uh, but nothing else about, uh, about the data report. Oh, we've, we've got one that just came in. Um, can you erase their prior work in, in the same assignment? Yeah, so if, uh, and I'll just kind of show this live. Uh, let's say a student finished the assignment and uh, you know they made some mistakes or you did some reteaching and you want them to try again. All you have to do is go to the assignment report, go to that specific student, click the triple dot next to their name and click delete progress. And then if the student goes back and clicks their link to the assignment, it will start them out at the beginning. Any other questions? Yeah, we've got one more. Um, is there a place that access or print all the scores for all of the individual students um, for all of their assignments. So I think they're looking for the dashboard that we've already started thinking about. Yeah, so at this time, uh, we only have reports at the assignment report level and then those student details report. We are working on uh, more complex ways for teachers to see data. And we are also finalizing a feature that will allow you to download a, a, a specific assignment report as a CSV file. So you can use it uh, in Excel or, or uh, various apps where you can do spreadsheets. Uh, but right now, uh, the only way that you can view that data uh, is uh, by looking, clicking the link and looking at the assignment report. Uh, you could also elect to uh, print your screen from your uh, browser dialog. Uh, in Google Chrome, you click the triple dot in the top right corner, uh, and you can elect to print data from there as well if you'd like to have a paper copy of something. Any other questions coming up? Um, yeah, we've got, um, uh, we've got one the data transferable to Canvas, uh, and I'm gonna add in Google Classroom looking to, uh, to push the scores back out. Great question. So uh, for pushing scores, that is a feature that we are currently finalizing. We did hope to have that out uh, a little bit uh, earlier than this uh, before the start of the school year, but we're kind of ironing out a few kinks there. Uh, but within the next couple of months, uh, we will release a feature where uh, when you're in your assignment report, if you'd like to push our scores into Canvas or Google Classroom, you will have the ability to do that. Uh, one quick note about scores. Uh, we do recommend that if you're going to, uh, if you're going to um, use scores as grades that you consider modifying those scores. Essentially, if you take a score and turn it into a grade from assessments, you're penalizing students for persevering, making multiple attempts through questions, and typically teachers like to encourage that behavior. So uh, we just recommend that if you're going to give students grades on an assignment, that you either modify the scores or many teachers uh, just give students a grade based on whether students are meeting their norms around doing the assignment. So did you turn your work in? Uh, did you complete the assignment on time? Uh, did you use an adequate amount of time based on the time stamp in the report? Uh, did you put forth your best effort from what I can see in the data report? So uh, there are different ways that different teachers might approach that. But yes, uh, we will be uploading uh, the feature where you can push scores into Google Classroom or Canvas, uh, hopefully within the next couple of months. Any other questions? Yeah, I've got a couple more. Um, can, let's see, where is it? Um, can you talk a little bit about the due date and what that uh, restricts students from doing, if anything? Sure, so. Uh, for example, uh, one person asked, um, after, after the due date, can they still access the assignment or a redo? Yes, the students can still access assignments after the due date. What setting the due date does for you is if a student completes the assignment after the due date, underneath their name in your report, you'll see how many days late they completed the assignment. So they can still do it, but in your data report, you're still able to see if they turned it in on time or if it's late and how many days late. So if you need to take action based on that, you're able to do so. Next question. Uh, yeah, and one, one teacher was asking about um, differentiating for uh, uh, the high scoring group, if you have any recommendations on data uh, assignments that you can reassign or what you can do with that. Sure, so uh, you may choose to, uh, and I'll kind of go over here uh, to assessments. Uh, you may choose to, uh, for instance, 
uh, go into uh, another, uh, either into a, a future standard uh, for a student. You could choose from one of our OER resources, so open education resources, you choose content that uh, maybe pushes students into the next standard or uh, maybe uh, questions from a curriculum that's a little bit more rigorous uh, than you know, what you're already using. So there are different choices there. Uh, you could also have those students uh, really build their uh, proficiency and mastery by assigning skill builders or problem solving sets, uh, which will address uh, uh, in a little bit. Uh, and then also we have release date tests. So, if, uh, uh, you know, especially for, um, uh, you know, say Massachusetts, New York, uh, California, uh, for many cases, their released items uh, are actually quite rigorous and uh, can present an opportunity that's challenging for your upper level students. Any other questions? All right. I think that's good for now. I'm going to answer a couple in the chat and you can move on. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Don. So now that we've had a chance to sort of go through some scenarios, uh, walk through what it's gonna look like day to day for you to, to use this data and, and, uh, and use it to inform your instruction and next steps with students. Uh, now we're going to just address uh, kind of what we already started talking about, which, uh, which is how you can use assessment content for differentiated support. Uh, so as in the scenarios that we just looked at, often your data is going to point you to a student or a group of students who need additional practice. Uh, assessments does have a variety of content that you can use for this purpose. Uh, the first go-to is assigning similar lessons from our OER library, like I said before. Uh, we have the uh, sort of practice problems, exit tickets, all that sort of stuff. You can assign any of this material that you like. Um, and then we have our problem solving sets. Uh, these sets are common core aligned uh, and they run from second through 12th grade. Uh, these are standalone sets of practice problems and uh, they provide extra practice for students who need it or it may just be a way to, uh, to get your upper level students to be really clear on uh, you know, making sure that they've mastered that standard by answering some different questions. Uh, those release state tests, again, that uh, give students uh, state test practice. And then uh, the other one is skill builders. So I, I mentioned that before, but with skill builders, these are mastery based. That means that students, when they're completing problems in a skill builder, uh, they have to get three answer, three questions correct in a row in order to proceed. Uh, and these are also organized and aligned uh, by Common Core ID. So I'm just gonna go over here and uh, show you what, this, what the folder looks like. And let's say uh, I just go in here and uh, Take a look at the skill builder. You'll notice that this is a little different from when you assign regular problem sets because you can't select problems. That's because students are, it's a large uh, set of problems behind a skill builder. Students are assigned problems from that large set randomly. Uh, so you're not choosing specific problems, but all of the problems cover the standard that's mentioned. And so I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, uh, well, you would click assign to Google Classroom if, that, if that's what you wanna do. So I'm gonna do that and assign this to my class. As we mentioned earlier, this is where you can do that release and due date, although you don't have to. And I'm gonna click assign. We can see that the assignment was successfully created. And so now I'm actually gonna to go to uh, my student account and I'll see that assignment listed here at the top. Uh, but let's, uh, I'll just go to the classwork tab and I'll go to that assignment. And then it takes students into the student view that looks uh, pretty similar uh, to what they would see uh, with, you know, with a regular problem set. Uh, so with this question, uh, I'm going to uh, just kind of put in an incorrect answer. Uh, it's saying, sorry, try again. So I'm going to put in the correct answer here. Okay, notice it gives me a red X. And now I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, I think I understand what I'm doing as a student now, I'm gonna go ahead and answer uh, three questions in a row uh, so I can demonstrate my mastery. And notice that once I get those three correct in a row on the first try, I can click finish assignment. 
and that's going to take me into my student report uh, similar to what students will see for a regular student report they can still uh, hover over the uh, rows here to see the problem uh, the question that they answered and then uh, I want to go ahead and show you what the report looks like on the teacher end uh, so I'm gonna go back here to my Google classroom I'm gonna go to a different class Okay, and I believe it was this one. All right, so if you're if you're a teacher and you're looking at your report for a skill builder, it will look like this. So it's going to show you each student attempt, right? Uh, and you're going to see how they did on the question. So the symbols are pretty similar here. You're going to get that total time that they worked on the assignment. You can still hide student names on this report if you want to uh, uh, anonymize and then show, you know, show this to students. Uh, you can also still click that triple dot and look at the details report or delete progress. Uh, the details report, it'll again show you that play by play. And then another interesting feature of our uh, skill builder report is, uh, you know, if you want to see this data, uh, these data as, um, as a regular report, you can click here at the top. And this is going to take you into a regular data report, uh, but it's going to show you uh, which stu uh, questions students answered. And so let's say, uh, you know, th this might be useful if you, if you notice here that student one, they struggled with this question. But if you see here, one other student did get that question, student five. So maybe you want to pair up those two students and have student five kind of help student one on how to answer these types of questions. Uh, so just a useful uh, piece of data that might be, you know, that might help you uh, figure out next steps. The other note here is that it says uh, daily maximum. You'll notice that. Uh, we uh, Students are kicked out after they get uh, up to 10 questions if they're still not getting that three correct in a row. Uh, however, if, you want, if a student wants to persevere or you reteach and you want them to give it another try, uh, you can always go back to that triple dot, click delete progress, and it will let them start over uh, with, a, with, a fresh, uh, you know, with a fresh start. So just a quick overview of the Skill Builder report. Again, it shows you each student attempt. It shows you that total amount of time spent. Uh, and again, if students get to that daily maximum of 10, uh, they are booted out of the assignment, but you can always delete their progress and let them back in after you reteach. One other quick note I wanted to make uh, was just after you've uh, pushed an assignment in, uh, from assessments into Google Classroom or Canvas, uh, you may decide that, uh, you know, especially if you're trying to uh, focus on helping one small group of students who maybe experience particular challenges with the assignment, uh, you can edit the assignment once you've pushed it to Google or Canvas uh, and actually uh, change who sees that assignment. So in Google, in this four drop down, you can click students and select who you want to see it. And when you click edit in Canvas, you can scroll down to the assign block and choose either subgroups or individual students that you would like to see the assignment. And with that, I'll go ahead and pause for questions. Dawn, do we have questions? <coughs> yeah, let's see. Um, is a student able to work on more than one skill builder um, over the course of a day? Oh yeah, uh, if you assign multiple skill builders in a day, uh, students can absolutely work on all of those at the same time, if you like. Yep. Yeah, and I think that's a great way to, uh, to kind of place students and uh, given that most of us are doing distance learning, um, if there's a particular skill you wanna see how students are, are competent with, you can assign a couple skill builders. Um, let's see here. Is there a way to uh, assign a problem with not through Google Classroom or Canvas? Uh, at this time, we only support integration with Google Classroom or Canvas. Um, we are working on uh, our Schoology integration and hope to have that out within the next couple of months. Uh, but at this time, you have to use either Google Classroom or Canvas in order to, uh, to use assessments. Any other uh, questions? Yeah, and, and one person had just asked that I think you just answered it, but I will say it again. Uh, can you see the Skill Builder report in Canvas? Absolutely. Everything that Brian showed classroom all the reports are available in canvas as well um, one teacher is asking about um, uh, grading students work whether it's on participation or whether there's rubrics and I think that's really up to the teacher but um, I don't know if you want to add anything about that Brian sure well like I said we our platform generates scores for excuse me scores for students 
So uh, what that means is if you turn that score into a grade, uh, you are penalizing a student for making multiple attempts and persevering through, you know, whatever challenging content you've assigned them. Uh, most teachers elect to, uh, you know, give students uh, a sort of grade on a point system based on did they show their work, did they turn the assignment in on time, did they make their best effort, uh, something like that. Uh, so uh, the, the key there is regardless of what you decide to do, just making sure that students understand what you're going to do before you assign to them, right? Uh, if you're just uh, using the scores, uh, emphasizing that the scores are, are sorry, if you're not going to use the scores as grades and you just want students to process what they get, uh, message to them what is their grade on the assignment based on, uh, right? Any other questions, Dawn? No, I think we're going to move on right now. Okie dokie. All right, so uh, we've talked about uh, our data reports. We've gone through some common scenarios you're gonna face in your classroom. Uh, and we've even gone into uh, you know, how you can leverage the variety of content that we have uh, to do interventions for students or differentiate for students. So now we're just gonna go through a few key questions uh, that you're gonna wanna answer uh, in terms of how assistance fits into your daily routine. Uh, keeping in mind that assessments is, uh, can be used in a variety of contexts. One key thing about our platform is that we don't tell the teacher exactly how to do things. Uh, we believe that you're the person that's most capable of making decisions that are best for you and your students and their families. Uh, and so uh, given that, uh, we provide a few different suggestions here. So our key questions to think about as you're thinking about how assessments fits into your routine are when will you and your students most need formative data? When and how will you share assignment data with students? What will you tell students is the purpose of this data and how is it being used? And then finally, the question that's sort of top of mind and hovering over everything that we're doing right now, how will you leverage assessments data uh, and content to support distance learning? So uh, for when uh, you and your students most need formative data, it may be during exit tickets or homework, warm-ups. Again, we don't prescribe when you have to use it. We want you to make sense of, you know, when that makes, uh, or we want you to figure out when it makes the most sense based on what you and your students need. Uh, when are you gonna share this data with students? You may decide like we did in our scenarios to share with the whole class. You may decide to pull a small group of students aside. You may decide to conference with an individual student or with their parent using that details report. So lots of different options available. Uh, in terms of the purpose of data, we recommend being super clear uh, what the data is being used for. Okay, so is it being used for a grade? Is it being used uh, you know, to generate that score to help you improve? Uh, which we definitely recommend. Um, explaining why data is both useful to you and students. Uh, and part of that is explaining to students how the data is informing your instruction. So if you're showing uh, data from a, an assessments assignment report, uh, you can imagine saying, okay, well, I noticed, you know, all students struggled with these two questions. Uh, so because you struggle with these questions, I'm not going to go ahead and do uh, some reteaching with you. And then we're going to follow up with some additional practice to see if you better understand the concept. You want to make those solid connections between the data that you're seeing and that you're sharing with students and the teacher moves you're making with them to make sure that they understand better after the end of the process. And then just some uh, great tips uh, for leveraging your LMS. Uh, so you can create assignment groups in Canvas or Google uh, by relevance, unit, or assignment type. Uh, you can add instructions or videos or otherwise uh, content supports to help students as they're answering questions. Um, you can post a question in the Google Classroom class chat or create a group discussion in Canvas that links to the specific assignment. Uh, and then we also provide a vi uh, two videos, one for Google and one for Canvas, that show you how you can maximize your LMS if you're interested in any more details about how to do that. I'll go ahead and pause here for questions, Dawn. Yeah, there's actually one about um, using Google Classroom uh, features. Um, is teachers asking, uh, can you schedule an assignment and then modify the assignment release in Google Classroom? Yeah, so if you set a release, if you set a release date and, uh, you know, when you assign it from Canvas and you want to change that, if you change it in Google, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dawn, that will actually update on our end as well, uh, so that the, the, the data is updated uh, across both Google Classroom and assessments. Yeah, and just to... I know some teachers like to think uh, a week or two weeks ahead. I was definitely not that type of teacher, but sounds like some of you are. Um, if you do want that flexibility, um, 
a sign maybe next Friday or you know a month from now and you'll have the ability to modify the release date of the assignment without students seeing it in your class up until that point. Um, so just to clarify, if you if you push it out today with a with no release date, you cannot change the release date. If you give yourself a good time, you will be able to modify and move it up. All right. Any other questions coming up? Nope, that's it. All right. So just some uh, some wrap up and next steps uh, to, to sort of uh, get people uh, on their way and, and, and started with assessments. Uh, to recap, uh, today we learned how to uh, sort of understand the, those key elements of our data reports, uh, how to quickly draw conclusions from the data reports and use that those conclusions to plan instructional steps, um, which uh, how the different variety of content that we have that you can use to provide differentiated support to students. Uh, and then the key questions you want to think about uh, and considerations for including assistance in your daily routine. We do have some upcoming uh, webinars, uh, and I apologize, it's a little bit outdated, but uh, we have our new, our new user webinar uh, part one coming up next week uh, on learning the basics. So if you want to recap, we also have our next drop-in session coming up on September 7th uh, as well, if you want to just drop in uh, and ask any questions that you might have. Uh, for our website, you can visit for more resources uh, if, if you'd like. I'm just going to go live and show you the website. Our website has been redesigned. Uh, so, but when you go to the website here, you don't just have to sign in and select problems and push those to students. You can go to our help center here where we have lots of user resources to help you with getting started, uh, various aspects, aspects of our platform, how to support parents and students, and so on, uh, and also a webinar library that contains recordings of our webinars. We have our teacher corner, which features uh, various uh, teacher voices, artifacts. Uh, we offer toolboxes, et cetera, from our experienced uh, assistance users. Uh, we have our professional learning section, uh, where you can learn more about uh, getting certified, our on-demand resources, check out our new user training, and so on. And then you may decide to get involved. Uh, we have lots of programs like our assistant ambassadors, uh, teachers for research and feedback, et cetera, uh, that you may want to get involved in. Uh, and then our blog here, uh, we have various blog posts from assistance users, experts, and assistance staff uh, that kind of help folks understand what we do, what we're about, uh, and how to use the platform. You can also join our Facebook user community. Uh, we have lots of teachers and assistant staff uh, who uh, go there, make posts, ask, ask questions, uh, respond to questions. So it's a very lively community. If you want to go and learn more. Uh, all users receive our monthly newsletter. Uh, and you can also connect with us on other social media. We're on Twitter. Uh, and I believe we're on LinkedIn, too. Um, and then we also have a YouTube channel. Uh, and obviously, if any questions pop up, if you want to stay in touch and ask us a question, you can email us at contact at assistance.org. And now, before we close out, uh, just wanted to give folks a chance to chat. Uh, what's your biggest takeaway from today's session? Uh, after we talk about this question, just have a few folks share their answers. We do have a quick, very short survey uh, that we ask folks to take. We are a free service, and so we absolutely depend on your feedback uh, to govern how we move forward, how we modify our sessions to make sure that what we deliver to teachers uh, is uh, at the highest quality possible. And so with that, Dawn, do we have any uh, big takeaways folks are sharing? Yeah, one person said, hey, learning about skill builders. Um, assistance provides um, uh, data for driven instruction. Let's see, I think they're coming in. Uh, the, the immediate feedback is gonna allow uh, teachers to be more effective. Mm -hmm. Another person, skill builders, the de data reports, how you can quick, quickly analyze the student um, data. Mm -hmm. More on skill builders, more on we find skill builders are kind of that one piece that even an experienced teacher may not have experience with. Understanding how the common wrong answers work on the. Excellent. And just to highlight a couple questions that came in, Brian, one person asked um, about the, the assistant certified program. So um, you'll find it on the website and that's something that um, you can get certified, kind of show that you know all about assistance, all the ins and outs through modules and assessments. You can email us at contact at assistance.org for more information. 
Um, and then one other teacher, because the because the calendar was outdated, was asking if there's going to be more drop in um, later in the fall, and we are going to continue doing those biweekly. And the sign up is um, is right on our webpage under webinar sign up. Yep, and we should have uh, the next couple uh, of drop in sessions up there, but we do those biweekly. That's right. Any other uh, any other uh, takeaways? Uh, people posting. Yeah, a couple loving how they can use this for differentiation. Excellent, excellent. Uh, so with that, uh, Dawn's going to go ahead and post in the chat uh, the link to our uh, feedback form. Again, this will take a minute or less. We really do appreciate your feedback. Uh, all of the feedback uh, that we get uh, is used to, uh, to sort of improve our sessions. Uh, and also, I just want to point out, uh, there's a typo here. You should be looking for, it's the new user part two, a deep dive on data. Uh, and the date for today's session uh, is obviously the 25th. So that's my mistake. And we'll give folks about 60 seconds or so just to get that done before we close out. All right, and uh, Don, can you confirm that the the link you're sharing is for the uh, the feedback survey, and not the registration form? Um, it should be. Let me double check. Yep, that's the feedback form. All righty, okie dokie. All right, so as folks are wrapping up their feedback, we do appreciate that. Uh, we appreciate y'all joining us today and taking time to learn about assessments. We hope that uh, our platform can be helpful to you and your students and your families during what we understand is a very complicated, uh, constantly changing, even more so than normal uh, and challenging environment. Uh, if any questions pop up after today's session, uh, you can feel free to reach out to us at contact at uh, And beyond that, uh, you are free to go. Please go ahead and uh, click exit from the uh, from the Zoom. And uh, uh, like I said, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to us at contact at assistance.